Welcome to Calvary Conversations. My name is Mariah, and I'm here with my big brother, Pastor Morgan Roders. Hey, guys. What's up? Today, we have a very special guest who is a speaker, an author, a podcast host. She's also a blogger and an apologist. She answers all the tough questions, has a YouTube channel, and she also... She's a author, so she wrote a book called Another Gospel, and we encourage everyone to get that in the description below. She's also a wife and a mom, and we actually had her dad on, Chuck Gerard. So without further ado, it's my honor and privilege to welcome Elisa Childers. Elisa, thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, great to be with you. Well, I'm blessed to have you because I was just telling you, I'm like, I was a big Zoe Girl fan growing mm -hmm. up. Still am. Me and my little sister were saying we were listening to in the car today, singing I Believe and stuff. So big fan since right. I was like five years old. I remember we walked into Gospel Supplies and I like put on the headphones and I heard um, the Life album. And hmm. since then, I've I've loved that album ever since like to this day, all the songs. So mm -hmm. but um, oh. before we get started, though, Morgan, can you pray for us? Yeah, let's pray. Dearly Father, I just thank you so much for this time. Thank you for Elisa uh, just being here with us and uh, taking time out of her day mm -hmm. and her busy schedule. And I just pray, Lord, that you would bless this conversation. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, quicken the things that you want us to talk about and uh, the things that people might be struggling with or kind of concerned about maybe in their churches or in their family members. So, Lord, I just pray that you would uh, show us how to communicate this to your people. Thank you, Lord, that um, you've given us your word. Mm -hmm. Thank you that it's uh, inerrant, God, that it's, it's perfect. Mm -hmm. And we know that people try to attack it so much. But I pray, Father, that we would um, stand upon your word, that we would not back down, but that we would recognize that even though this world is changing and everything that, you know, they're saying truth is relative, mm -hmm. but God, we know that the truth is in your word. So yes, I pray God. that we would stand upon that and that we would be able to, um, to declare that to people, whether it's a podcast, whether it's just talking to a stranger on the street, whether it's a message or even through worship, God, we pray that we can proclaim it boldly and that you'll give us the words to say. So please, uh, bless this time, and we give it to you. And it's in Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. 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 All right. Well, a lot of our listeners know who you are, but um, for those who don't know you, obviously I already said that you're part of Zoe Girl, but um, who are you and what do you do? Can you just share with our listeners a little, like, a bio of you before we get into your testimony? But. Yeah. So you mentioned I was in music. I, I have been in music my whole life. And so what I do now is kind of different for me. It's a new chapter in my life. And essentially what I do is I have a blog and a podcast and a YouTube channel and I write books mm -hmm. in the vein of apologetics, which is essentially just giving reasons for why we believe what we believe mm -hmm. is true about mm -hmm. Christianity and about um, the Bible and all sorts of of topics related to doctrine and theology and just the truthfulness of the Christian worldview. Yeah. Mm. And we love that because I, I was just saying that to Morgan. I was like, I want to get into more of this stuff, but sometimes you just like don't know where to go. But I've obviously grew up listening to your music, but then now seeing like your YouTube channel and answering the tough questions, like I love that. So mm -hmm. um, we also want to get into your testimony, just like your upbringing and what, your life was like, obviously you grew up in a Christian home, but maybe just to share like whatever else you want to share about your upbringing. Hmm. Yeah, I did. you're right. So I grew up in the Southern California in the San Fernando Valley, and I was raised in a Christian home, very committed Christian home. My parents were uh, very genuine Christians who gave me the gospel. I really think they gave me the real thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I don't remember a time before I was aware of the presence of Jesus, before I believed deep in my heart that the Bible was his word. Mm -hmm. Now, as a kid, I wouldn't have been able to tell you why. I wouldn't have been able to articulate why I believe the Bible is the word of God, but mm -hmm. I just knew it. And I did my best to live my life by that and uh, was really involved in ministry as a teenager. Um, I, right after high school, I moved to New York for a year and a half, two years to do some uh, ministry in the inner city there, mm -hmm. moved back to LA for a year. And then I moved to Nashville in 99 to take part of Zoe Girl. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And it was cool because we had your dad on 
Chuck, and he was like talking about like his testimony was a lot like my dad's just growing up and having a wild past and like alcohol, drugs, like all that stuff. And so I grew up hearing from my dad, like what his story was. I'm like, I don't want to do that. Like hearing Mm. all Mm. that he went through, just how honest he was. And it was cool because when your dad was on, he really humbled himself before Mm. everyone. And he was just saying like, I wasn't always there. You know, like I was busy traveling because he was with Love Song and all that. So um, he was just saying how he was just so thankful for obviously your mom, his wife, and just all that she did, like raising you girls, right? You, there's three of you, three sisters or four? Four, four. actually, yeah. Mm-hmm. One of yeah, four. That's awesome. And so he was just saying how he's like, man, I wasn't always there, but like just understanding that it was also your heavenly father, that was the most important, like mm-hmm. your guys' relationship with the Lord. It's not just him, but so we were thankful to have him on. But can you also maybe share, so you got part of zoe girl in 1999 yeah because i remember first album was out in 2000 yeah and then 2001 yeah. was the life album but what was that like being in a band with girls you obviously had sisters so it was probably easier yeah that was kind of natural that part was natural and mm-hmm. thankfully me and the other two girls chrissy and Kristen, really got along very well mm-hmm. we um we just had this sort of kindred thing and um, we were just, it was us, us against the world, I guess you could say. So we, we had a really good relationship, uh, I think as a band. So I'm very thankful for that, but well, it was a really interesting, um, experience because there's pros and cons to it. I think, hmm. uh, by the time that I got into the music industry, it was really an established industry. And so, uh, everything was very organized. And so I, looking back, it was such a joy to get to minister to young girls and get to, um, speak to some of the issues that they were going through in their lives, especially girls that were going to public schools and felt kind of like they didn't know how to share their faith. And so th- those were the, the good things, the really good things about being a part of the CCM industry. But you know, I think there's some some pitfalls too. I think there are some things that essentially made me vulnerable later to some confusion theologically, which I write about in my book. Um, but you know, it's it's an interesting phenomenon, the whole phenomenon of Christian celebrity, because as humans, we're not created to be worshipped or <laughs> praised, and yet yeah. you get on a bus and then you get into a new venue every day where essentially that's what's happening. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. there are all these sort of tensions and struggles involved with being a touring musician, especially in the Christian environment. And it can kind of make you jaded. It can make you cynical. And so I, I fought against some of that. It can make you apathetic. Mm-hmm. I think it made me kind of mm-hmm. apathetic where I just where I was so passionate about reading my Bible before that. I got really lazy with stuff like that. And Mm -hmm. so um, it was an interesting experience. I'm glad I got to have it. I'm also glad I'm not still doing it. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. I know. And it it was like a blessing. Like God worked it out. I mean, for me growing up, I remember singing the song. So the one that I love the most was I Believe and just declaring that because I went to a public school when I was younger and oh. my brother Morgan actually he would read his Bible and right like mm-hmm. people teachers were even kind of making yeah, fun of you. Yeah, tell me to put it away. Mm-hmm. There was one teacher that was really cool. She gave me, she was a Christian. She actually gave me like this uh, Christian bookmark. So she didn't, she never really said it, but she kind of slipped that in there. So, yeah. but besides that, yeah, it was hard to do that. And that was just in elementary school. So mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. And so it was just encouraging because it's like to not be ashamed of the good news, the gospel. Mm -hmm. And like you were saying, as a young kid, I didn't like fully know how to defend that. But like with my life, I was like, I just know, like I had that childlike faith, like no God is real. Like you don't have to tell me, like I've seen it. I guess what I kind of knew is I saw it in my dad's life. Mm -hmm. So that Mm -hmm. really helped me. Like I saw the change, like the once he was blind and a wretched sinner and then now he can see and then he came to the Lord. So that was always stuck with me. I remember I'd always only tell my dad's testimony to everyone. I was like, my dad used to be a drug dealer and he used to have like sex and do all this stuff. And then he almost had a, he had a gun to his head. He was about to kill himself. And then the Lord spoke to him and now he's a pastor. And I just remember telling people that, but then it wasn't until like for you, like right when you get out in the world and you're not in the Christian home anymore, you're around Christian people, but it's still, it's not until it's like you understand, okay, what do I really believe? Like, do I actually believe this? So can you talk about, 
I know you have talked about, I listen in other podcasts, then, right, going to a church and then seeing Saul de Sap happen with the pastor and stuff. But also, so you're in Zoe Girl, you're out of it. You got married, I'm assuming, right? You talk about, mm-hmm. and then you had kids, and then you can share you any of that. Did you say you married the drummer? Too. Oh, really? I, I did. Yeah, I, I didn't even know that. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that, that you're so right. It's, it's like when you grow up in it, you can sort of take some things for granted. Like growing up, Mm -hmm. I never, I never really cared about defending my faith Mm -hmm. or Mm -hmm. uh, trying to demonstrate why I thought it was true. And it wasn't because I was so sheltered, you know, my, we would go out and do street evangelism Mm -hmm. and I met people that did not believe Christianity was true, but I was easy. It was easy to just sort of brush aside what they were saying because Mm -hmm oh, they just don't have the Holy Spirit, or God just hasn't revealed this to them yet. And so it didn't rattle my own faith. Mm. But after we came off the road, and like you mentioned, I was married, I had a new baby, we started attending a church in um, just right here in the Nashville area. And it was a non-denominational evangelical church. Mm. And we loved it. My husband and I had never really experienced a church like this, where the community was so strong. The pastor had these really deeply intellectual sermons. And one of the things that really attracted me to the way he taught was that I I was so weary of preachers who were shouting and yelling. And Mm -hmm. I I just I wanted nothing to do with any of that anymore. Mm -hmm. And he was so calm and so intellectual. And so this was really attractive to us. So we attended there for eight months or so. And then the pastor invited me to be a part of a smaller discussion group. And he Mm -hmm. described it like it would be something like seminary. If you if you go through this four year class, you'll come out on the other side of it with a seminary level education. And I just remember getting to the first class and there was about 12 of us. This is a very small inner circle type of group. Mm -hmm. And he announced to us that he was actually agnostic. Mm -hmm. And that really confused me because I thought, okay, well, I met people that called themselves agnostics when I would do street ministry on in Hollywood, but I've never met a pastor who would identify himself that way. And so I had this inner monologue going on where I would just tell myself, well, don't be so judgmental. Just hear him out, see what he's got to say. And so as the class went on, virtually everything that I had believed about God and Jesus and especially the Bible were really picked apart and explained away. And what I didn't know at the time is something we're hearing about a lot now, and that's this phenomenon of deconstruction. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially what I just said. That's when somebody who grew up in the church, they start dissecting their beliefs and picking them apart. And most often they end up discarding those beliefs. And so he had, he had been through that process and I learned later, in fact, I even learned this after I wrote my book, Mm. that he did it intentionally. He was intentionally trying to get people into the process of deconstruction. While I was in the class, I I fought against it. I would try to argue with him. I would try to refute him. Mm -hmm. Didn't do a very good job of it, but I tried. But it wasn't until we left the church that Mm. all of those doubts that he planted took root in my own heart. And essentially, now that I think about it, it's more like, he deconstructed me. I didn't mm. understand what was happening to me, but I was in deconstruction, but I didn't want to be. Mm-hmm. I didn't I didn't have anyone to talk to about it. I didn't understand what it was. I never heard that word. But, uh, you know, and I, I didn't ex- deconstruct all the way into atheism. Mm-hmm. But I was, I think at the, the worst point of it, I was double-minded. Mm-hmm. I fully believed that intellectually, Christianity was not true. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I knew Jesus and I loved him and I didn't know Mm -hmm. what to do with that. And so it was a very painful time. Wow. Wow. That's crazy. I know because a lot, I've been seeing that a lot recently and I was like seeing on YouTube everywhere, like deconstruction. So can you explain that for listeners who are like, okay, what is that really? Why is that happening? And why is that such a, I guess, a big thing right now? People have always been deconverting, yeah. even going back to the scriptures. You have people who were, they were with us and then they went out from us. They were not of us. Mm-hmm. And we see that happening all through church history. Yeah. I'm, I'm even thinking back to the, uh, probably, I don't know if it was around the seventies, but Bertrand Russell famously deconverted from Christianity and wrote the book and, and, you know, lots of people heard about him, mm-hmm. but think about, we've got like 50, 500 of him today yeah. because of the influence of social media. Mm-hmm. I think that 
we're living in a time in history right now where you can deconstruct and you can deconvert from the Christian faith, which deconstruction and deconversion are not always the same thing. Mm -hmm. Often a deconstruction will end in deconversion. Mm -hmm. But we just have such a platform to promote it now. Mm -hmm. So where you might have had in years past, somebody might lose their faith and they walk away quietly or they just, you know, they go just leave the church and live their life. Now you have this whole machine ready to accept you into this community of deconstruction. Mm -hmm. There are YouTube channels and Instagram uh, pages. There are people offering classes to help you deconstruct your faith. Mm -hmm. And so it's really flipped into this positive thing. And so I think it's becoming such a phenomenon because there's a community ready and available uh, if you are having doubts mm -hmm. to lead you in that direction. I think that's a huge reason it's so popular right now. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, I know my dad was like he had a friend who went to seminary and then he came back and he didn't believe that uh, scripture was true and he didn't believe in biblical inerrancy. Yeah. And it seems like that's crept in, I guess, as we talk about progressive Christianity, it seems like that's even crept into seminaries. Yeah. Have you mm. heard a lot about that or anything like that? Oh, yeah. Seminaries are some of the worst breeding mm. grounds for it. In fact, uh, so much, much, much of the scholarship being done right now in biblical studies are from deconstructed Christians, deconverted Christians. Mm. Bart Ehrman is a perfect example of someone who grew up in the evangelical church, and he uh, deconverted, and he's really on a mission to deconvert young people. And he's mm -hmm. teaching, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Bible classes at, uh, you know, in a, in a major university, uh, NC Chapel Hill. And, um, it, you know, he's just one of many. And, mm -hmm. and so this, this liberal scholarship that began to emerge in the late 1800, or, uh, 1800s and early 1900s, um, it's really continued to infect the church mm -hmm. and become possibly the dominant view of scholarship uh, when people go to seminary. So there are very few seminaries, actually, that still would come to the, the Scripture from the angle of believing that it's the Word of God mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. coming at it that way rather than coming at it from a secular angle and saying, well, hey, we know miracles don't really happen. So when you read about a miracle in the Bible, that's just, you know, we can learn a moral lesson from it, but we don't believe that that happened in history. Both have to do with kind of your presupposition you're bringing into the text, mm -hmm. but that has certainly become dominant, um, I think, since the Enlightenment, probably. Yeah. yeah, and what's concerning is that those people become pastors, and then they yep. do things like what happened to you, and they just kind of put those questions in your mind and it can turn out good like for you you deconstructed but then you like really researched and you saw that your faith was more than just it wasn't just an empty faith it was based on facts Amen. but yeah that that guy that I was talking about that my dad was talking to he said my dad's like don't be a pastor then yeah. like if you truly believe this he thought he was joking at first mm -mm. and my mm. dad's like the only way I'll sort of respect you is if you step down from ministry yep. because you're going to lead a bunch of people astray. And uh, yeah. it seems like, sadly, people come out of semi seminary, or my dad calls it cemetery <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> they come out and then they spread all that, you know, and mm. people think, oh, they're a Christian. They went to seminary. They're, mm. They have all the knowledge, but that doesn't mean that they do. So, well, yeah. yeah, crazy. And then just for you, can you maybe explain more to our listeners that, right, there's traditional Christianity, which, I mean, people hear that and they can be like, well, that just doesn't sound good, right? Like, sounds like Catholic, like tradition. But it's like, I love how you always say, like, we need to define the terms. And then mm -hmm. there's progressive <laughs> Christianity. But then explain um, what that is. You wrote a blog on it, like a blog post about it, like a year ago, talking about that. So I, I just would like to hear maybe defining what traditional Christianity is and then get into progressive Christianity mm -hmm. and like the, I think you had like five steps or like five things to know whether mm. you're like 
to kind of identify of that, it. Yeah, to yeah. identify that. Yeah. We can talk through that. So I, I prefer the phrase historic Christianity. Oh, and the good. reason, and, you know, traditional Christianity works. There's other mm. phrases that work. Uh, the reason I chose the phrase historic Christianity mm. is because when I'm defining Christianity, I'm trying to be very careful to define it uh, according to the earliest sources, being Jesus, the apostles, the earliest church fathers. What did they think Christianity was? Now, of course, there are going to be different styles we see throughout history. There's going to be different uh, ways people come to worship. There's going to be all kinds of things that we're going to disagree about, even on mm -hmm. secondary issues. Um, but the reason I use the word historic Christianity is because very often progressive Christians think that if you're defending things like the deity of Jesus or the atonement of Jesus, his sacrifice on the cross or his second coming or final judgment or heaven or hell, that you're just sort of defending this modern system of evangelicalism or something along those lines. Now, I do identify myself as an evangelical as defined originally, mm -hmm. being that you have a high view of scripture, a central view of the cross of Jesus. I do have all those things. Mm -hmm. But, you know, evangelicalism could go off the rail. I, I mean, there's been a lot of problems, I think, in the last, especially last few years yeah. that almost make me think we should just do it, do a different word, yeah. come up with something else. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm not defending evangelicalism. I'm not defending what someone might consider to be conservative Christianity, because mm -hmm. what I'm defending is not a political uh, view. Mm -hmm. It's not, um, it, it's historic. What is Christian? What's the bare bones mm -hmm. of what Christianity is and has made it, something's made it unique in the world for 2000 years. Mm -hmm. Something has mm -hmm. caused Christians to stand up and even go to their deaths. I mean, there are beliefs that we hold. Yeah. So that's what I refer to as historic Christianity. So mm -hmm. the opposite of that would be progressive Christianity. Mm -hmm. And so a good way to think about progressive Christianity might be, it's very hard to define. That's mm -hmm. the first thing, first thing we need to say. And the reason it's hard to define is because progressive Christianity is not creedal, like mm -hmm historic Christianity is. So historically Christians, we, we would have creeds, which are short sayings, easy to memorize, easy to learn to, so that we know we're on the same page. Mm -hmm. We, you know, we have the Nicene Creed. We have creeds that go all the way back to the first century. Mm -hmm. And we, we use those creeds to say, Hey, we've got, we're on the same page here yeah. with what we believe. It's not that way in progressive Christianity. You can believe kind of not, I mean, pretty much whatever you want mm -hmm. about Jesus mm -hmm. and his nature, and you're still going to be included in the community. It's not going to be a big issue. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's hard to believe. It's very fluid. There's a broad spectrum of beliefs that fall under that umbrella. But a helpful way to think about it might be if we were to compare it to historic Christianity. And historically, Christians have viewed the people who knew Jesus, who walked with him, who were the closest to him in the flesh as the ones that would have the highest authority to be able to tell us what Christianity is and to define doctrines and things like that. This is why we consider the, the, new, the apostles to be authoritative mm -hmm. um, sources. They wrote our New Testament and or, or people who were close to the apostles. So we, we have those sources. We view those as having the highest authority. Mm -hmm. It's the opposite in progressive Christianity, those people are often viewed as those who represent Christianity in its infancy. So these were just the first people who were trying to figure out who God is and, and what Jesus' death meant and all of this. And so it's like a baby learning to crawl before it walks. But as we evolve and as we uh, come to a higher and wiser view of God, as Brian McLaren puts it, you know, we can look back on what they wrote and we can analyze it more like a fossil mm -hmm. and say, well, this is what Paul believed about God. This is what Peter believed about God. But, you know, we, we might believe something different today because we are more evolved. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. in, in that sense, it's like Christianity itself is progressing. Oh. And so that's the view. So there are oh. going to be things like you mentioned, the five things, there are going to be things that characterize it. Mm -hmm. And as I researched the movement, I really learned that they're, they're all over the place on what they affirm, but they're pretty united in what they deny. Mm -hmm. So Largely speaking, progressive Christians are going to deny that your sin would separate you from God. You know, they're going to teach you that you are not separated from God. You are inherently good and united with God already. Well, of course, this sends the whole gospel into a tailspin, like or almost like dominoes. You know, you knock that one down. Well, then you don't need the atonement, which 
they're, they don't like anyway because it's referred to as cosmic child abuse, the idea that God the Father would require the blood sacrifice of his son. You know, this is something that's just considered to be morally repugnant in progressive circles. Um, of course, they're largely universalists. There's not going to be many who believe that there's a literal hell, mm-hmm. no matter what people might uh, debate about what the nature of hell is or the uh, the extent of, of what that all means. In progressive circles, generally, they're going to say there is no hell. Is it Rob it's Bell? He fine. says that. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, Rob Bell wrote the book Love Wins. He never actually said that, okay. but all of the questions that he asked in the book sort of would lead you to the the conclusion that mm-hmm. there is no meaning, or, or if mm-hmm. there is, um, it's more the 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 ramifications of our bad choices. Like when we sin, mm-hmm. and then we get the consequence from our sin on earth. That's really more mm-hmm. what hell is. Mm-hmm. So there was a lot of things that were implicit in that book, even if he never outright said yeah. that he was a. So useless, it could be but, implied that hell is more of a temporary thing to just just the consequences of your sin, and then it might pass. Is yeah, that... or more like a. It, it, there's a view called conditional immortality that I would not consider to be progressive. Although sometimes mm-hmm. it gets mistaken, where the view is that God will punish those, um, you know, unrepentant sinners in hell, according to the the deeds they've done, and then they will cease to exist. I disagree with that view. I don't mm-hmm. think that's what the Bible teaches. Um, but and and some progressives, there would be some overlap, but their view would be more like. It's here on earth, like the consequences of your bad choices here. If you hurt someone and then you lose relationship with them and there's pain there, that's hell. That's the the consequence of your bad um, choices. Now, Rob Bell in his book did speculate in just one little section about the afterlife. He said, you know, maybe the afterlife is something like that. Mm-hmm. And so that was kind of the extent, at least that I understood, that he was really speculating on the afterlife, which mm-hmm. is very interesting because in progressive Christianity, you don't hear a lot about the afterlife. It's very much about the here and now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think that's tied into their view of, you know, whatever the nature of heaven is going to be, it's all going to be fine. Everybody will be there, where, whether it's God building his kingdom here and, or whatever it's going to be, it's going to be fine mm-hmm. is generally the view. Yeah. Has New Age played a part in that? Because it sounds a lot like you know there's similar qualities of new age Mm -hmm. so has that is that where a lot of it came from or what do you think yes actually i have a blog post called um i forget the part but it's basically how new age and progressive christianity are basically the same thing uh and it's there's so many similarities in fact uh Mm -hmm. i have friends who come out of the new age and they have youtube channels and it's amazing how much our work overlaps we work together a lot because there's so much overlap Mm -hmm. and um new age beliefs are i mean frankly they're kind of in all of the church but in Mm -hmm. progressive christianity especially they're very 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 deeply embedded in new age concepts like the cosmic christ Mm -hmm. universal christ Mm -hmm. um the the nature of jesus being similar to new age so yes there's there's very very much a similarity there it sounds a lot also like so my dad he was like kind of a missionary he was like a youth pastor at an elca lutheran church and Mm -hmm. they remember i remember one of the ladies who was teaching us kids she would told us like this they brought us all with like all the whole church and all the kids would be there for like sunday school and she read the like story of jonah and then she said if you believe in this fish story then you should believe in this. And then she started reading a fairy tale. And so they oh, were just wow. teaching there in this same church. They they were like, believe in like all this stuff, like with um, homosexuality, like that, that was okay and all this. So it was very weird and liberal. And, but it's crazy because like so many churches that we're seeing, they're, there's, it's all about self. Like it's all about how you feel, what you want to do, you can do. Like the pastor at that church he cheated on his wife for a secretary. And when my dad first got there, they were doing their wedding. And my dad's like, what is going on? And the pastor actually, he had to lead him to the Lord because he didn't even, like my dad there said, like, if you bring your Bible to church, you're not going to last here that long. And like these kids were like coming to the Lord. That's actually how he started the church because then my dad got fired for too much Jesus because that's all he talked about. And it's like, well, it's kind of what it is as a Christian to talk about. But um, and then it's just crazy because there's like a lot of churches like that nowadays where I think so many people like I guess I think it was good that you were talking about, too. It's not even conservative Christian, because obviously when everything was going on with the election, we are getting into politics and all that stuff. But I was even looking at these churches that were so 
bold to stand up for these political things, but not the good news. Like they're not oh, yeah. the gospel they're putting away. So it was like they, I mean, they would call it them being like, like other churches, oh, they're woke and stuff. But then at the same time, I'm like, I'm looking at your life and what mm. you guys are doing. And that's very new age and all about self and how you can be comfortable. So can you talk about that? Because one of the points I remember you're saying is how they really get into feelings. And that's mm-hmm. like the big thing that I'm seeing mm-hmm. a lot of churches like, oh, how you feel and what you think is best instead of like actually just reading the word of God and realizing, no, this is the truth in the word, not your mm-hmm. feelings or you had a dream. Like the truth is in the yeah, word. Yeah, no, mm-hmm. that's that's great because it, one in, really interesting thing about the class that I was in in the church that I was kind of wrote my story in my book is that when they finally kind of came out as a progressive church, which was years after we left, by the way. So it was years later, they mm-hmm. they took down the Apostle and Nicene creeds mm-hmm. and they broke their own creed and put it up and called themselves a progressive Christian community. Well, in the creed that they had written, it was something like we respect the power of personal conscience. Mm-hmm. So they mm-hmm. had shifted from saying the Bible is our authority for truth to saying your conscience is the authority for truth. Mm-hmm. And so this is something that's widely acknowledged in the progressive Christian movement. Now, they probably wouldn't like it being worded like, oh, we're all about our feelings. They would say, no, we're not. But God's mm-hmm. given you this conscience that you can decide. In fact, in her book, uh, Inspired, the late Rachel Hall Evans talked about how God's given you this conscience. Like you're supposed to know when you read the Bible, which parts are true, which parts are false, which parts are facts, which parts are fiction. And she said, you know, filter that through what causes you harm, reject the stuff that you think is causing you harm Mm -hmm. and move toward the things that, that make you whole and that bring you wholeness. Well, the, the scary thing about interpreting the Bible that way is imagine if our children made their medical choices that way. Mm-hmm. You know, what if I allowed my kids to say, well, you can just avoid anything that you feel is harming you mm-hmm. and just move toward you. You can accept anything that moves you toward wholeness. Well, they, they'd probably be dead by now <laughs> because they, they wouldn't get any cavities filled. They would, you know, there's a lot of stuff they'd be like, yeah, I don't think this is leading me toward wholeness, you know, Mm -hmm. but as, as their mom and as, you know, their doctor has more information than they have Mm -hmm. and how much more information does God have than we do? And so, uh, yeah, I think it's a dangerous game to make your own conscience and your feelings, essentially your preferences, your opinions Mm -hmm. to be the, the moral authority for what you think is true. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is why historically Christians, of course, we've debated about biblical interpretation and we've we've robustly argued some of those points but mm-hmm. Christians have settled their debates based on the scripture this is our authority for truth this is God's authoritative divinely inspired word and that's what gets thrown out in progressive Christianity mm-hmm. it's so sad. yeah what I notice is that when we with progressive Christians we've given them scripture and they just deny it you know they're like well I I don't know I just don't feel like that would be what God would do. Mm-hmm. But then they My don't God even, do yeah, <laughs> they don't even bring another scripture to debate it or anything. They're just like, I just don't feel that. And they just come in judgment of God's word. Yeah. But they think, you know, they say how much they love Jesus and everything and how, oh, you're so unloving if you're holding to his word here, you know. But they, they try to say where it's not like, oh, I'm just denying God's word. I think you kind of said that. In a sense, there uh, it might have been one of your first points. You're saying, um, not in this podcast, but you're saying how Jesus. I think they kind of they're basically saying Jesus is a liar mm. if you if you look at it because you know Jesus talked about the scriptures, right? He didn't think it was just something that's evolving, and so yeah, mm. it's wild. They you see they start to say that Jesus is a liar and God's a liar. Um, you know, they start inferring that and I'm not even saying they're trying to, but they end up doing that. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, And I don't think they would probably like you kind of said, like, they're not going to come out and say Jesus is a liar. Mm -hmm. But when you, when you look at what Jesus had to say about scripture, they do definitely disagree with Jesus. That's very Mm -hmm. clear in, in the positions that are taken in the progressive church. And, and that, that is, I think the thing that's the most inconsistent is there are progressive churches that share memes that say the Bible is not God's word. When you have Mm -hmm. Jesus 
referring to the Old Testament scriptures yeah. several times yeah. as the Word of God. I mean, it's very clear Jesus thought the Bible was the Word of God. Mm-hmm. And so if you're going to say, no, it's not, well, it's like you have every right to disagree. You have every right to make up your mind and say, look, I think this is what's true. But I think that if if it's a little bit inconsistent to call yourself a Christian and disagree with Christ. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> yeah, I was listening to a sermon with Vody Bauckham, and he was talking about, he's like, so many Christians, they talk about, how like, well, Jesus never talked about homosexuality. He's like, that is not true at all. He's mm-hmm. like, Jesus did. He's like, even referring back to the Old Testament. And and then when he would talk about um, how like, if you even look at a woman with lust and just talking about all these stuff and talking even yeah. about pornea and all these things, he's like, definitely that would talk about, if you're saying he didn't talk about that, well, then you're also saying that incest isn't wrong and like bestiality yeah. and all this other stuff. He's like, yeah, That's... Jesus never said anything about felony home invasion. <laughs> so. <laughs> so you can do it. Yeah. I know. And so it was just, it makes me sad because it is true. Like, I think the sermon was talking about, like, how they made him a sissified Jesus. And with Jesus, like, they make it where, okay, we don't talk about sin. Like, he didn't really make a big deal about it. And it's like, that. none of that's true. If you just read the Gospels, you would see. But so many times, because I remember even Stephen Van Cars was saying that, like, so many times these people are so bold to say, oh, like, we believe this and that, but they never actually read the scripture. And then even when they do, they're not doing it with a heart to, like, learn. They don't want to know. Because, right, even when we read the scriptures, we have to ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us and to just be sensitive Mm. to that. But, I mean, it's crazy because a lot of churches, right, it's hard because then I think the arguments and the things that people go about nowadays is, like, right, there's, like, crazy hyper charismatics but then there's like reformed where they're like okay well we believe that all the gifts are like str- like strange fire and all this stuff so they got like two camps mm-hmm. there and so i think a lot of times um i forgot who was saying this they were giving sermon they're like they already see the problem in the church that there's going through it and so they're hurt by the church just seeing like there's always like that they're already arguing so we're gonna like start our own thing or like we want to experience stuff and right they get into new age because they're like we want to experience like these mm. signs and wonders but then they're saying like bethel and all this is weird so what do i do and like for us because we believe spirit and truth like we just had dr sam storms on and we're like we believe because he even calls himself he's like i'm a ca- charismatic calvinist he's like i believe mm. in the sovereignty of god but i believe the gifts are for today because why? Because the Bible says that and yeah. the Bible talks about that. And he always just quoting scripture. And so I would be interested in what you would say about that with people. Cause that's what I hear from like a lot of, especially young adults are like, I just am sick and tired of all the Religion. fighting and stuff. Yeah. Religion. And so then they mm-hmm. don't want to go to church at all. Mm-hmm. So what would you like encourage maybe a young person that's trying to find a church, you know, they have their own family, young children. And they're like, I don't know where to go. Like, I don't know what to do because it's kind of overwhelming. Like, I don't even know where to start. So what? Some yeah, advice? and you brought up a great point about the extremes because mm-hmm. we do have extremes on, on different topics. Mm-hmm. You know, you mentioned mm-hmm. the, the one extreme of the hyper charismatic versus the so hard cessationist that it's, you know, of course, cessationists aren't going to deny that there's a Holy Spirit, but mm-hmm. Um, you can almost become like a functional naturalist on that side of things. And then there's mm-hmm. extremes like, uh, like you mentioned, like hyper Calvinist versus uh, open theism would be like, you know, extremes. And so I think maybe just avoiding extremes. I love when I sat down to talk with the pastor of the church that we go to now to try to figure, I mean, I, I, you know, in this climate, you got to like ask the 50 questions, right? I just yeah. had a grill, like, what is the church's position on this and this yeah. and this and this and this? And I loved that he's like, well, we don't, we don't really take labels as far as like Calvinist or this, but here's what I believe about, you know, ask me about any doctrine and I'll tell you what our position is. And I loved that because um, I think that, that you're right. I think sometimes, uh, now certainly not, there are people deconstructing out of good churches too. So it's not just, you know, some kind of bad church experience, although that does tend to play out in a lot of the deconstruction stories. Mm -hmm. So my advice to young people trying to find a church is, I I think you gave the advice really well, you know, you, you want to a church to be alive, you know, Mm -hmm. you don't want to feel like it's just, but, but it's also you, it's okay to choose a church where you like the style of worship. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people who like the more liturgical people like the more free 
um, worship. I think what you're looking for is theological soundness mm-hmm. in worship. You know, you might like the more traditional, you might like the more modern, just make sure that what is being sung is actually glorifying God Mm -hmm. and not just worshiping how we feel when we worship, Mm -hmm. because I think that that's a mistake that can get made a lot. And then I would just look for consistent Bible teaching. Um, You know, I've noticed that even pastors that teach straight through, they'll even do topical, but they're still teaching straight through the Bible. Mm -hmm. I think that doing series of you know, through the Bible, teaching, uh, ex- expositing the scripture is mm-hmm. so important. Instead of just, it's so easy to pick a topic that's your hobby horse and then find all the scriptures <laughs> from all over and like make that work. Yeah. And it can yeah. be very tricky for people to, par- you know, to discern that. Mm-hmm. But when you mm-hmm. have to, I remember listening to a, a Bible teaching by Alistair Begg one time and he was, he just preaches straight through Genesis to Revelation, then they start over and they go back. Yeah. And he said, well, one of the downfalls of having to preach through every verse of the Bible is you can't skip anything. Yeah. And so he had to yeah. teach through this really tough passage. And so, um, but yeah, I, I would just, and I would look for, I think too, in this climate, there's a lot of spiritual abuse, abuses of power that I think are related to the social media platform and celebrity and the cult of personality. But to really watch for that, especially in this moment in our church history. Um, really make sure that the leadership structure at your church is biblical. Make sure there's checks and balances. There are elders that have power. Um, that that And what I mean by that is that there's not just one guy yep. that can do whatever he wants. Mm-hmm. Make sure there are people that he's submitted to and yeah. accountable to who could actually fire him if they needed to. I mean, there, there needs to be um, that plurality of elders mm-hmm. to be able to provide that type of accountability because that helps keep um, that sort of bully pastor abuse of power thing from, from happening, mm-hmm. um, when it's done right. But we see that a lot right now. And, um, I think that's something we need to be very careful about, especially young Christians. You know, it's, it's so tempting to look at this guy who's, man, he's speaking truth and he's doing all these things. And, and, you know, just look at how he's treating people. If yeah. he's is kind to people, mm-hmm. could, could you bring your concerns to him and say, look, I kind of, I disagreed with what you said on Sunday. Can you help me understand where you're coming from? Can I show you some scriptures? If that's met with hostility, I'd say run. Mm-hmm. Now, it doesn't mean he's going to change his position, but a pastor should have the humility to say, yeah, tell me what, what you're concerned about. Let's look at the scriptures and let me just kind of explain my view and mm-hmm. let me hear from you and I'll pray about it and, you know, whatever. You just want to see that humility there yeah. with things yeah. like that. Amen. Yeah, and that's what my dad always says. He's the pastor here, but he says, like, if if I say something wrong, that's why he always tries to give scriptures for mm-hmm. everything he mm-hmm. says. Because, and you know, I know that sometimes we can maybe twist a scripture, but he says, sure, we all yeah, do. if we do that, if I do that, come up to me and tell me, you yeah. know, and show mm-hmm. me a scripture. Don't just do it based on feelings, you know, like, oh, yeah. I just feel like this is wrong. But like if there's a scripture and I really am twisting something, you have to tell us, you know, like we because then that will help the body. That's not just mm-hmm. for that person. If the pastor is yep. preaching something that's wrong, he needs to know. So, yeah. Amen. Yeah. And it's been cool because we've been seeing like our church. God's really been refining all of us with all of us, like a lot of people getting sick and stuff. But then realizing what's going on in Afghanistan, we're like, mm-hmm. we mm-hmm. are so just lukewarm like we think we're on fire but we're really not like you're seeing these people who are willing to stay in a country where they know that they're going to be killed Mm -hmm. and they're willing to go to church even though they know okay this could be my last day and we're afraid to go to church we don't think that's that important we can just go to the football game and like do all these things and like we need to understand that the bible is true when it says to not forsake the fellowship that's my dad says we always bring it back what does the bible say about this and Mm -hmm. I've just been seeing God put like a fire in all of us to realize like you need to count the costs. Like mm-hmm. you need to realize why are you doing this? Are you just doing this to get followers? Because there's also big trends on being cool hipster pastors and having a cool Instagram with all these reels and stuff and being funny. Like I've gotten sucked into that to try to do that and thinking, oh, it's going to reach people. I'm like, we can't reach people. It's only by the power of the Holy Spirit and prayer. And that's the most important, like seeing us going through all this pain and my like dad being in the hospital, we're like, all we can do is pray. We mm, can't yeah. like try to change someone with our words and what we can do. It's only by the power of the Holy Spirit and the truth of God's word. Yeah. So I don't know, but I, I just think that's, been... that's one of the things that we've struggled with is yeah. like 
we see a progressive Christian or we just see yeah. someone really led by their feelings we and we just want to give them. them the fact, you know, we're just like, the scripture says this, this, this. <laughs> so I know sometimes we've gone to the other extreme and we need to be more loving, but how, how do you talk to a progressive Christian? Because I was talking to someone, you know, a, a friend who's uh, kind of left the church, but they're still kind of like they kind of like it, but they kind of don't. You know, they they want to go more by feelings. Um, but how how would you suggest I should talk to someone like that Definitely. or people? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good that's a good thing. Um, so I'm going to recommend a book that. I found to be incredibly helpful to help navigate tough conversations like that. And mm -hmm. it's a book called Tactics by Greg Kokel. I just bought that last night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, honestly, and I think, and I think that um, it's, it can be really powerful, especially with somebody like a progressive Christian who might be embracing moral relativism, which is essentially the view that, you know, that's what we're talking about with your, your preference or your opinion decides what's morally good and true. Mm. Um, it can be really helpful to to navigate a conversation by asking a lot of well-placed questions. Mm -hmm. um, for example, one effective thing I have found with progressive Christians, well, effective too, it depends on how entrenched in it they are. If somebody mm -hmm. is 100% all in, um, you know, by, except by a miracle of God, you're probably not going to get very far yeah. if you bring up any kind of religion or anything at all. But if somebody's more confused and maybe they're just sort of like, I don't know, I'm open, mm -hmm. you know, a great question would be, um, so if you, you know, if you're a Jesus, or would you call yourself a Jesus follower? And they're probably going to say yes. And then you say, well, where do you get your information about, you know, like, how do you know who Jesus is? Where do you <laughs> get your information about Jesus? Yeah. And it could go one of two ways. They might appeal to a more mystical experience they have with God, or they might even say, well, from the gospels, you know, I read about Jesus there. Mm -hmm. They answer that way. Um, it can be a really effective question to just ask, well, what do you think about what Jesus view of the Old Testament scriptures? What do you, what do you make of that? And then mm -hmm. that could even open the door to share some of that information if they're open. Mm -hmm. If the answer with the more mystical, well, you know, I think Jesus is the, you know, the universal Christ or Jesus, you know, attained Christ consciousness. And I'm, you know, at that point, um, that's a really tough conversation to have because that's really just coming from um, a deeply entrenched pre a commitment to a certain type of metaphysics, right? Mm -hmm. It's a certain type of view of reality and how things work. And so to to sort of expose that, you really have to expose relativism. Mm -hmm. So I, I, on that side, I would go to truth. Like, well, how do you know what's true? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if someone says, well, it's just something I feel inside, you know, you can go, you can go to the conversation on that thing. What if what I feel inside contradicts what you feel inside like what mm -hmm. if you say that um it's good to um you know treat children kindly but i say i think it's good to whack children in the head every time you walk by them <laughs> and then they're going to say well everybody knows that's wrong and you're just like yeah i agree but but how do you yeah. who decides Where's between us if i yeah if, if something's broken in me and that's what i think who decides between us? Yeah. You know, yeah. how do you justify saying that's a good thing? Because that's really the, the underneath so much of that more mystical stuff is, yeah. a, is the view of relativism. So maybe reading a book on relativism, learning about it yeah. and how to interact and engage with it would be helpful. Yeah. yeah. Thank yeah. you. That's good. Yeah. Well, we've taken up a lot of your time, but mm -hmm. do you have anything else you'd like to share to our listeners before we get into? And even maybe just because we want to talk about where they can get your book your mm -hmm. website and all that, your resources, but do you have anything else you would like to share before that? Oh, I just, I loved talking with you guys. <laughs> I, I love what you're doing. I love, I thought your questions were all so good and I had so much fun with the conversation. If anyone wants to connect with me, I have a YouTube channel, Elisa Childers. You can listen to my podcast, the Elisa Childers podcast. I, I don't blog so much anymore because I've been doing some book writing, but you can get my book, Another Gospel on Amazon or uh, you can go to elisachilders.com slash another gospel for all the links of the places you can get it. Yeah, okay. and we encourage everyone to do that. That'll be in the description below. So go get her book, Another Gospel. And also your YouTube channel has been such a blessing and just getting into apologetics and realizing how to defend like the death of Christ, the resurrection, and just the Bible. So mm -hmm. I'm excited that we were able to have you on, but um, do you have anything else, Morgan? Yeah, I do you have any other um, books or some to like help people get into apologetics? Because I know that some of us, you know, even mm -hmm. me as a pastor, I was just kind of 
grown up in the church and everything. We do verse and by verse. By yeah, verse. yeah. Like I, I see, you know, certain apologetics things, but um, yeah. Do you have any starting books for some people who want to get more into that? Your book, for yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Best starter book for apologetics is I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist by Frank Turek mm -hmm. and Norm Guy. That's just the best starter apologetics book because it's going to take you through the whole case. And then mm -hmm. you can, if, you, if there's a chapter you like, there's going to be 50 million books on just that one topic. Oh, cool. So it's a great place to start. Yeah, my yeah, dad loves Norman Geisler, so that's awesome. Yeah. All, too. all right. Well, we'll let you go. But sure. thank you again so much for joining us. We've had a great time with yeah, thank you. Thank you. Me too. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much for joining us on Calvary Conversations. If you haven't already, please make sure to like, subscribe, and share this video. If you would like to just listen to us wherever you get your podcast, just type in Calvary Conversations. You can also follow us on Instagram at Calvary Conversations. Thanks so much to our sponsors, Mission Heating and Cooling. Please make sure to check out their website in the description below. You can also support Calvary Conversations by clicking on the support button in the description below. Thanks so much, guys, and we'll see you next week.